I don't have words to express how much your warm welcome means to me. Thank you. And to see so many students here just warms my heart. Riley, you did it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alex and Nancy, for your incredibly generous introduction. I offer my gratitude to each of you for being here today. I am so very grateful to the Presidential Search Committee and to the entire Holland University Board of Trustees for extending this leadership invitation to me. As I have shared with you, I commit to endeavoring each day to be a reflection of the mission of this institution that we all love so dearly. Thank you for this opportunity. I am truly grateful. I, thank you. I would also like to publicly thank the Holland University Cabinet, who have been so warm and supportive each time we've talked with one another. I am grateful to each of you as well and look forward to working together. And I have to extend a very special thank you to Nancy Gray, um, who's become my bestie very fast. <laughs> Um, the powerful thing, and I've shared this with Nancy, but I want to share it with each of you. The powerful thing about Nancy is I could so clearly see the heart of Holland University when I spoke with Nancy. And I am just so truly grateful for your friendship and your support. And it is truly a privilege to follow in your footsteps. So thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Please know that I am honored to join the Holland University community and look forward to talking with and getting to know each of you, both personally and professionally. On behalf of my husband, Robert, and my children, Halela, Hillel, and Hosanna, thank you for the opportunity to join this community. We look forward to sharing our family with you and we're excited to embrace Hollands and to call Roanoke, Virginia home. I actually grew up approximately 145 miles southeast of here in a small community called Kittrell, North Carolina. And Kittrell is a fairly typical small Southern community. The train goes through on occasion there is a Job Corps training facility. There used to be farms there when I was a child. And as we all do, the people there, my people, yearn for something more, something better, something filled with hope. In that small rural community, I grew up in a home that was filled with love. But that was our most abundant and at times our only resource. Yet our focus was never on what we lacked. Rather, my mother intentionally focused us on the idea that we had so much more than other people, she would say. And while that argument could never have been made about material possessions, she always said that if you're able to think clearly, you have an obligation to give back to others. My mother would say this all the time when we were at home, when we were going to school, when we were in the grocery store and she was telling me no when I asked for something. We have more than others. No, you cannot have that cereal. <laughs> for my mom, it always came back to the fact that you aren't defined by your material objects, but by your intellectual resources. And of even greater importance was that those resources were to be utilized in support of and in service to another. So from my very earliest days, I was taught that my purpose in life is to serve others. I will confess that I didn't know how that would unfold. And I certainly never envisioned leadership at this level. I would say I had ambitious dreams but like so many who grow up in poverty or who grow up feeling less than or marginalized for whatever reasons, I was careful with whom and how I shared my dreams. I kept them close in order to protect them and to protect myself. You see, according to Raj Chetty's Opportunity Atlas, on average, my cohort of classmates from Kittrell who share my demographic had a greater than 50% teen pregnancy rate, 
today have a median individual income of $21,000, and only 21% of us graduated from college. But I didn't really need a wonderful Harvard economist to tell me that. We understood structural injustice when I was growing up. We lived in equity daily. That's who I am. That's where I come from. And yet somehow, somehow, I have the privilege of standing with you all today. So what changed my life? What allows me to be here? What altered my zip code destiny, as it's called? Well, to be clear, I have the privilege of being with you not because I was smarter than or richer than my classmates. I have this privilege today for two reasons. One, I had a small group of people who believed in me and told me that I could be something. And two, and perhaps most importantly, I'm here today because I was able to access an education, a liberal arts education. And I want you to know that I am not being hyperbolic when I say that the liberal arts saved my life. I have shared many times that there is not a single doubt in my mind that had I not been exposed to the liberal arts, I would not be here today. And yes, it was within that tradition that I learned how to think. I learned how to deconstruct and reconstruct knowledge. But even more, a liberal arts education is about our relationship with learning and our relationships with people. For me, it was a faculty member who saw beyond my poverty, beyond my lack of social capital, and beyond my insecurity. She saw me as a person, and she gently said that you can do this. And that's what made a transformative difference in my life. It wasn't a college president. I don't know if she'd ever been to a diversity training. What I do know was that she saw my humanity and she insisted that the great values of the liberal arts tradition could change the trajectory of my life. That's what I hope to do as a leader for the young women at Holland University, to see your humanity, to journey with you, and to together create the life that you want for yourself. And I know that that is what we do every day here at Hollands, within and outside of the classroom. Whether it's for our core academic enterprise for women at the undergraduate level, our critically important graduate and continuing education programs, the Horizon program, the athletics program, the arts, the writing center and beyond, Hollands transforms lives. And having been a young woman transformed by an education and then able to impact the lives of others, that is what drives my commitment to the mission of Holland University. So as we begin our work together, my call is for each of us, no matter our position or role on this campus, to lead so that every student on our campus has a champion who believes in them and the transformative power of the liberal arts. My call is that we embrace the fact that we change lives because of who we are and what we do as a liberal arts institution. The liberal arts transform those who've had every material need met but still question their worth. The liberal arts develops the skills needed to help those who have great ambitions access opportunities. For some young women, the validation of their hopes and dreams and being equipped by the liberal arts to pursue them without apology is what we do. And for those who've had very few resources, the liberal arts expands your world and compels you to expand the world of others. The liberal arts in Holland's transforms lives. In fact, Charles Cox's original sentiment for Hollands indicated, quote, this institution is not designed to be a resort for the pleasure-seeking, 
the idol, or the profligate, but shall be sacred to the cultivation of sound learning, virtuous feelings, and independent thought. Sound learning, virtuous feelings, and independent thought. This is remarkably beautiful and resonant language, though I know I was likely not who our founder envisioned. But one cannot understand the future without knowing the past, both its beauty and its pain. So I began to know Hollands with that founding vision. You see, the past offers touchstones that frame who and what we want to become. It signals what we must never allow again, and it reveals parts of ourselves that must never be compromised. So my reference to the original mission is not to excuse the pain or ignore the systematic injustice of that time, but rather to excavate the highest academic principles and recast them for all. We, everyone in this room together, will implement a vision for those our founders may have never imagined as we work to ensure that every student on our campus is seen, heard, valued, and able to accomplish her grandest aspirations. In order to do this work, we must collectively and collaboratively work to build a future that enables us to not only continue to serve every student with distinction, but to do so in such a way that is sustainable and that leverages our strengths. This opportunity for mission-driven growth is not a new one for Hollands. Bessie Carter Randolph, class of 1912, and one of our presidential predecessors wrote, quote, the foundations of life and learning must be deeply laid in the liberal arts, in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, in that rich and alienable heritage, that precious residuum, residuum of human experience must furnish the guide to the far off ends of human destiny. Higher institutions must, she wrote, if they are to survive, adhere with unflinching faith to the long run task of preparing thinkers, never selling truth to serve the hour, end quote. We, all of us together, will be unflinching in our faith to our long run task as we seek new opportunities for shared success. We will determine as a community what cannot be compromised, and we will create space for that which may be new and invigorating. Hollins has done much under the success of many leaders and everyone who comprises the community to achieve its goals over time. And all of us here today, again, no matter our role, will continue that legacy. Today, we take up the grandest ambitions of the institution and with a sharpened lens of innovation, imagination, and inclusion, we envision who we want to become. So to that end, over the next few months, I want to hear your hopes, your dreams, your fears, and your ambitions, and I will hold them in my mind, but even more so, I will hold them gently in my heart. And together, we will create a collective vision. Our vision will transform and inspire us. And in that ultimate vision, I won't see my full reflection. And likewise, when you look at it, you may not see your full reflection either. But if we look closely, if we look at the values articulated, the strategies indicated, and the ways we will measure ourselves, I feel confident that we will see one another. Developing this vision will require active engagement, the nurturing of trust and confidence, and working with a sense of urgency balanced with thoughtful deliberation. It will require us to be open and invite change while maintaining the soul of who we are. It will require that we journey together with purpose and with hope. Annie Dillard, class of 1967 wrote, new ideas come in and out, new information and theories, and Hollands stirs with excitement, as it always has. New buildings arise, new leaders emerge, 
New talent pours into the freshman class, and it still Hollands. Where girls become women, where students have time to learn in depth, and professors have time to give them. Where the grass is green and the mountains are blue, where friendships thrive, minds catch fire, careers begin, and hearts open to a world of possibility, end quote. I look forward to and am grateful for the opportunity to partner with each of you who are the soul of Hollands. I look forward to our hearts open to a world of possibility. possibility. So thank you. Please know that in the spirit of our school motto, Lavave Oculus, I will lift up my eyes to the hills for you. I will lift up my eyes to the hills with you. I will lift up my eyes to the hills because of you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you.